Hello and welcome to the Somerset Archaeological and Natural History Society's talk about the nature of Somerset Coast. My name's Lizzie Indooney and I'm a trustee for SANS and I'm also chair of the Historic Buildings Committee of SANS. Today we're going to hear a talk about the nature of Somerset Coast by Nigel Phillips. Nigel worked for the Berkshire Buckingham and Oxford Wildlife Trust for 30 years initially as a reserve warden, then as head of reserves, managing nearly 90 reserves. He then became the head of strategic planning for landscape scale conservation projects. On retiring night early, Nigel moved to Neverstowey. The Somerset Wildlife Trust asked him to try to raise the profile of the somewhat underrated Somerset coast. From 2011 to 2018, he ran the, ran the South SWT Marine Awareness Campaign, organising walks, talks and conferences about the coast. He's written a book called Somerset Coast, A Living Landscape, which supported this work. His next book will be The Nature of Somerset Coast, which will be published by Pisces Publication in February or March next year and all the profits from the book will go to the Somerset Wildlife Trust to support their coast conservation work. In today's lecture, to make things simple, Nigel will be taking questions at the end of the talk. To ask a question, you will need to activate the chat button at the bottom of the page and type in a question. To find the button, just run the mouse over the bottom of your screen and a series of buttons should pop up. If the button's not there, it might be at the top right or even hidden under three dots. Because we're recording this lecture, we won't use names at the um, question time. It's free to register for the talks, but a donation of four pounds towards the ongoing costs of SANS would be gratefully appreciated. The donations button is on the SANS website donations page. When donating, please leave, label your donation COAST. You can do this under a small tab labelled Add Note. To make things easier, a link to the donation page will be posted at the, in the chat button at the end of the lecture. So, over to you, Nigel. Okay. Am I there? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me along, Sands, to talk about Somerset's coast. It's a subject uh, very close to my heart and something which I am very passionate about. As Lizzie said, um, in, back in 2011, uh, Somerset Wildlife Trust said, would I try and raise the profile of our coast? Um, we have to admit that many people who live in Somerset do tend to drive south to the Dorset coast, which is a beautiful coast. I, I can't get away from that. Um, and, and tend to think of our our coast, the Somerset coast, as being rather muddy. Well, it is a little bit muddy, but it's also a glorious place for both landscapes and also for the wildlife that, that it holds. And um, in the 10 or so years that I've been walking Somerset's coast very intensely, we found some amazing wildlife and also been able to introduce a lot of people to the wildlife that we, we have on our coast. And we do seem to be uh, pushing an open door and, and we now have many more people to appreciate both uh, the wildlife and, and the landscapes of the coast. Um, you do have to pick your time about going because of the high tidal range that we have, but it, it is a, it's a, it's an astoundingly beautiful place to have literally on our, on our doorstep. Again, as Lizzie said, I produced Somerset Coast of Living Landscape back in 2011. We sold 2,000 copies of that, which has played a, quite a role in raising, raising the profile. And during the last uh, two years, I've been working on a, on a, on a new book about the coast. It's, it, it doesn't make the old one defunct. It just follows on with much more information, particularly about invertebrate in sand dunes and also about things like lichens and bryophytes, uh, you know, mosses, mosses and lichens. And I have been working with people involved with sands, people like Pat Worsley on, on, on the lichen part of, of the new book. But I think the coast really talks for itself. And so I'm going to, uh, I'd like to bring up my PowerPoint presentation now and take you through what I think are some of the most amazing sites that we can, we can see on our coast. So Nathaniel, can you pull up my, or do I still do that bit? Me do that? Yeah, 
Yes, if you could do it yourself. I could yeah, yeah, I, I got used to you doing it all for me. <laughs> Here we go. So this is uh, standing on Doniford Beach. Uh, in the distance, you can see Minehead with a white dot of, of the Butlins um, tent, tent thing there. And of course, it is part of the big blue planet that, you know, that, that amazing blue world which encircles our ocean. We are part of that. We are on the Seven Estuary. It may be a bit murky sometimes, but we are linked to all those other wider and wonderful seas. And as partly to be able to prove that, I've been snorkeling in Somerset's seas and you can't snorkel everywhere on Somerset's coast. You can't, you can't snorkel at Clevedon very easily. But if you go as far west as we can to Porlock, Porlock Weir, and go out to a place called Gore Point, which is just about a mile west of Porlock Weir, you can snorkel. You do have to pick your time. Uh, you need to have a clear, bright sunny day. You need to have had a pretty steady sea for a week or so, so the sediment drops. And then if you follow the tide down to the low point here, you'll come across this kelp forest. These are the bigger seaweeds, ore weeds and sugar acts, um, which form really quite significant underwater forests, which are occupied by an awful lot of other wildlife too. So pick your time, pick the right day, the right weather, and down we go. Um, I've never met anyone else who's ever snorkeled on Somerset's coast. I'd be interested to know if anyone else listening today has had a go. I do seem to be a lone, a lone person. Um, so there we are. We're down in the kelp forest. This is uh, some of the bigger ore weeds over our head. That's the base uh, of sugar rack, one of our big seaweeds. And there's ore weed again. It hardly ever clears to the extent that you can see for meters and meters like it does on places like uh, the Isles of Scilly, where I also snorkel quite a lot. But you do get a most amazing introduction to an underwater landscape. Uh, the bigger kelps do have a lot of wildlife living on them, both seaweeds and uh, invertebrae. And on this one, you can just see in the center here, there's some blue rayed limpets, which are stunning, tiny little marine mollusks, which have, um, they, they burrow into the the, the stem of the seaweed as they as they feed on it and they end up in a in a sort of protective little enclave little volcano isn't that that most gorgeous marine animal i mean so exotic it's as if it's been designed to us to appeal to our aesthetic senses so that little um little uh, marine mollusk is only about the size of your small little finger now so it's tiny but once you get your eye in you start to find all sorts of similar small and very exciting marine critters so here we are again looking at the, the base of the of the kelp forest seaweeds don't have um, roots they have hold fasts which uh, just hang on to things they don't they don't draw any nourishment out of what they're hanging on to and the pink stuff um, covering the rock there is is a red seaweed uh, called paintweed. They're quite hard to identify accurately, but there are about four or five or even six species of paintweeds that we get on our boulders. And if you start looking into the base of these holdfasts, you'll find a myriad of little tiny seaweeds, but also many, many small marine critters. That is a whole sort of micro world in its own right. And in there, you'll find things like, uh, like well, the painted top shell, which is a marine mollusk that we only find on the very lowest part of our shores. And I'll show you some more marine mollusks later on. And those are other, other red seaweeds there amongst the, uh, the green uh, and brown seaweeds at the, at the back there too. It is a, a, another world completely. And uh, very few people believe me when I talk, start talking about starfish on Somerset's coast. I say, well, we don't have starfish. Well, we do, of course. We have about 10 species of starfish on our coast. This is the biggest one, the common sun star, which can be up to uh, 20 centimetres across. So it's, we're talking about something like a dinner plate and that's at um, Gore Point. This one is, uh, is from Minehead. If you follow the low tide down at Minehead, you'll find these amazing marine creatures there often in their, in, their, in their dozens or even their hundreds if you, if you hit on the right day. So that's the, the com common, common sun star. Many people recognize um, sea enemies, I think. These are um, marine creatures very closely related to corals. Uh, when the tide drops down, they just look like these, these blobs. 
Uh, but when the tide comes in, of course, is when they come into their glory. So this is a, a bead lit anemone, um, again, found through snorkeling um, at, at down at Gore Point. But they occur right along our coast, right up to, to bring down. They're called bead lit anemones because of these blue dots uh, around the top of the, of the animal's column. And what those are, in fact, are um, fighting equipment. The tentacles you can see catch the food. They will put in all sorts of small creatures to eat. But the blue dots are actually super strong stinging cells because sea enemies move about on their rocks and they fight each other for the best feeding place. And they will lean over and sting an approaching sea enemy to make it to push off. Um, all done in quite slow motion for us, but for them it obviously is their normal way of um, moving about. These are gorgeous critters. Uh, we also have the snake locks in the enemy. You don't really get these further uh, east than watch it. But if you go anywhere west from watch it, you'll start to find these. Um, again, these are the, the tentacles, the stinging tentacles, which they use to catch all sorts of small marine creatures to eat. Um, and this one is, a, is a, an awesome creature called the strawberry anemone. Can be almost the size of a tennis ball or the size of your fist quite a big animal. Um, this is one of the scarcest ones that we have, but you can still find lots of them if you go to the western parts of the coast. Uh, and there's one with the tides out, and that's what they look like when the, when the tide comes in. So that's the strawberry anemone, which is a big creature the size of your fist. Obviously, you'll find younger ones, which is smaller than that. Now, this is perhaps more the sort of sea that you think about when you think about Somerset's coast. It is muddy, we are at the mouth of the Severn Estuary, vast amounts of sediment does come wash down to us from fields and land way up in, in Shropshire and up in, up, up in Wales. But the sand, the, the silt and the mud that we get here is also a huge advantage because it's these big silty shores which are exposed at the super low tide <clears throat> that are occupied by vast millions and trillions of small marine creatures which are e eaten by wintering wildfowl and waders when they come to visit us in the winter time. So these are Dunlin in February and this is standing on Barrow Beach uh, in, in February uh, when the sea is pretty rough it's just full of silty mud you wouldn't even want to go swimming here at almost any time of the year but it is full of amazing wildlife uh, that comes to visit. So there are there are four major estuaries in the southwest which are used by winter visiting birds. There are lots of other estuaries in the southwest, but most of those are rocky ones and, bre and wintering waders don't like them. They like the big, wide, muddy shores. So the River Tor, out of those four, the River Tor in Devon has about 13,000 birds. The Hale in Cornwall, about 18,000 wintering birds. The River X, where everyone goes to see those avocets and goes on those avocet cruises, has about 25,000 wintering birds, but the Severn has up to 100,000 wintering birds, which is absolutely astonishing um, number of birds to see in the sky. But it's not about, as I say, not about being the, the biggest or the best. It's about how all these estuaries join together in the Sound West and do make an incredibly important place for wintering birds to come and visit. So here we are, uh, Barrow Beach in February, March. Uh, it could be before Christmas too. These are all Dunlin. There's about 6,000 Dunlin whirling about over the um, incoming tide. When the tide was out, they were down the ground feeding, but as the tide comes in, they get pushed up onto the upper shore and they swirl around, a bit like the starlings do over on the levels. The high ground in the background is actually the contox, which looks, it's been enlarged by the telephoto lens that I'm using. So these are all done in swirling around and then at the highest point of the tide, uh, if it's the beach is fairly quiet, they will just roost, sit like that, for an hour or so at the highest point. Those are all Dunlin and they are part of a flock of around 6,000 birds that was swirling about. Of course, our beaches aren't quiet all the time. And one of the issues that Somerset Wildlife Trust and Natural, Natural England are looking at, um, sorry, English Nature is looking at, is how we can try and get better protection for these birds when they're pushed up on to the higher parts of the beach in the, in the winter time we might need to have some sort of warning scheme and advice to not let your dog or your whatever fright the life out of these amazing birds, which are trying to have a, 
have a rest. I don't know whether you tried to watch waves on these beaches. They're often very far away. It's in the winter time. There may be not much bright light. The birds can all look much the same. But on a good day, uh, with a binoculars or telescope, and if they if they land in front of you, you can start to work out what you're looking at. What what we've got here, just out of interest, is um, uh, just we've got we've got um, these two here. The lower one is a knot and the upper bird, uh, so that's a knot down there, that's a dundin up there. They can be quite hard to tell apart. You do need to practice and you need to have good light, as I said, and, and, and a chance to see them closer. So these are just about all, all knot. And when I've been doing my photography and research down here, I started to realize that a lot of these birds had color rings on their legs. And this one here, for example, has a knot. Can you see it's got a got a yellow band on its leg. So I started to do some, um, some searching and talk to the people who are deeply involved with bird ringing as, it, as it's called. And um, I, sorry about that. I, I found out that these, these knot had had rings put in their legs on two places. They'd had rings put on their legs when they'd been caught in nets in Iceland. And they'd also had rings put on their legs when they'd been caught in the nest way up here in the northern Arctic areas of Canada. So the knot that come onto our beaches are coming from where they breed right across this top area up here, an incredible journey. We're very lucky and we should be very proud of providing this wintering habitat for these birds. Because although they breed up in those northern Arctic areas, they're only up there for about a month or six weeks. And then they come down to us, uh, or they come, can come down in September time. So they're with us September, October, November, December, January, February, and into March. They're with us for seven months of the year, which basically means they're really more resident with us than they are in the places where they breed. And if you really think, start to think about that, we have an even greater responsibility because we look after them or provide habitat for them for a much longer period of time than the area where they be. It's important that their nesting areas are, are cared for too, but we have a huge responsibility, responsibility for those birds that breed up in those high Arctic areas. It's an amazing sight. It can be very cold. Um, this was a good day in March when the light was good, the knot and the dundling were swirling about. And it was a pretty amazing sight. And also swirling about in roughly the same place around the river, the mouth of the River Parrot and across to Barrow and, and, and almost up to Breen sometimes, we get these wading birds. These are avocets, not easy to mistake for anything else. We have around uh, between six and 800 avocet that winter with us every year. They are basically are at the mouth of the River Parrot. They also now breed with us on the Steert Peninsula, where there's the new Wildfowl and Wetland Trust, uh, Steert Marshes Nature Reserve. But they were wintering in this area way before the Steert Marshes project was known uh, or even thought about. They've actually been visiting Somerset Coast since about 1959, when about six birds started to come from, probably from Holland, and to spend the winter at the mouth of the River Parrot. And slowly that has built up to, we now got between six and 800 birds who winter there every year. They also now breed on the Steert Peninsula, which is great news, absolutely magic sight to see them. They're so, so distinctive. And so, well, so I think they're absolutely gorgeous. Also in the same area between the mouth of the River Parrot and along to Barrow, you can see uh, black-tailed godwits uh, which are uh, rather fabulous looking birds. I think you can see that each one of those has got a black tail, which makes it a black tail godbit. These birds also come over from uh, sort of Germany and Holland where they, where they breed. They come to us in, in much smaller and much less regular numbers, um, but we often get between three and 4,000 of them. And they also tend to move between the heart of the Somerset levels. They winter between places like Catcott and Ham Wall over on the levels. And then when it's very cold and wintry inland, they move to the shore 
to our part of the coast at, between the, the, the mouth of the River Parrot and, and Barrow Dunes because it's much milder on, on the coast itself. So these are all black-tailed godwits, so you can still see a black tail on, on the underside. So we have an international responsibility for those 100,000 wintering uh, wildfowl and waders that we get, but we also have many other birds come to winter with us, things like um, uh, uh, red wing and um, field fares and thrushes which come, to other, you know, even missile thrushes and song thrushes which come to us from Europe. But on the salt marshes, you, that's barrow, uh, barrow and then Breen down in, in the background, on the salt marshes which run between Hinkley Point um, and the Steer Peninsula, we get uh, quite good numbers of shorted owls. Okay. Okay, so here's a short-eared owl on the salt marsh um, at Steart. Fabulous bird. They breed up in um, well, they breed up in the Lake District, they breed up in the Pennines, they breed up on places like the Isle of Mull up in northern parts of Scotland. Um, they have occasionally bred on Exmoor, if we're very, very lucky. But basically they're a wintering bird to our salt marsh areas. Um, they're a day flyer. They fly usually in the afternoon and then in, into the evening. Pretty amazing looking bird, that wonderful golden eye. And we may get up between 10 and 15 uh, short-eared owls on the coast at any one time if we're lucky. This one uh, was going down. I actually managed to see what it caught. It's actually got a mole in its, in its beak there. They usually quote as catching voles, which they do, but this one must have seen a, a mole moving about and, and get, managed, managed to catch it. Shorted owl. And in the same sort of area, this is the shingle bank that runs along the seashore at Steart, uh, going up towards the mouth of the River Parrot. And this is a favourite place for snow buntings. A few pairs breed on the Cairngorms, but most of the ones that we see on our coast are, are, have come from Europe. Sparrow-sized birds, but bird, but pretty diagnostic with the, the white on the chest and the white on the face. So here we are, here's our, our coast again. Uh, this is looking down towards, um, towards Burnham with the famous, uh, the, the, the light. Well, it's not, a, it's a shore mark, uh, the stilted shore mark there. And on this part of the coast, we do have a pretty substantial SSSI. This is the, bridge, this is the Bridgewater Bay SSSI out on the sea, the hatched area. But the, this, this green area here is the Barrow Dunes uh, site of special scientific interest. And this is a fascinating place. This is also a very busy part of the world with many thousands of caravans parked uh, along that neck of the woods. But the dunes, despite being very busy, are still a very important place, both for plants and animals. And on the northern tip of the SSSI, we have the, the Barrow Dunes Local Nature Reserve, which is owned by Sedgemoor District Council and is looked after by a group of volunteers uh, who are based in Barrow, the Barrow Dunes uh, Conservation Team, who do a great job in trying to keep the place sorted out. Now, uh, <clears throat> sand dunes are quite evocative places, aren't they? We, we like to go and use them to run around and play. They support a lot of wildlife. They're also a sea defence uh, deposited there naturally over many hundreds, if not thousands of years. And when they get cut by, by the waves, people tend to go into a panic and worry they're going to be washed away. But of course, the, the whole sort of dynamics of sand dunes is to be washed away and then they rebuild again. And in fact, it's pretty important that your sand dunes are knocked about and then have to regrow again. Because on that leading edge of the sand dunes, where you get this pristine, freshly deposited sand, that a lot of plants um, depend upon so they can actually then colonize the bare, the bare sand. Plants like prickly saltwort uh, and also sea rocket, which don't grow really very well in stabilized sand dunes. They're always on that leading edge. So um, of course the big problem is we've got climate change, rising sea levels. This sand dune wants to move back, but it's got a caravan site and it's got a road. That's one of the big issues we do have to think about and um, that is not going to go away in, in, in the future. But I'm not talking about the sort of the ecology of that at the minute, we're talking about the wildlife. So there's sea rocket on the dunes at, at Barrow, fabulous native coastal plant, there it is in, in flower. We also get things like sea spurge, 
uh, a member of the Euphorbia family. Now on the other side of the coast, uh, there's a spurge bug, which is quite a scarce bug, which lives on the spurge. It's been recorded in quite big numbers on the Welsh part of the coast, but it's never been found on our side of the coast. And I maintain that's because we haven't had enough entomologists looking for it. In the, on South Wales, there's a much more active gang of coastal wildlife people. And because our coast has been sort of tarred with the brush of mud, a lot of people just don't go there to look. So I'm hoping in the near future, we are gonna find the spurge bug on our sea spurge. It's a, it's a, great, a great insect. We also have sea bindweed there, which is a, a close relative of the hedge bindweed, which of course gets into your garden and can cause havoc. This is a wonderful seaside plant, big shiny green leaves, big flowers up to five centimeters across. We also on Barrow Dunes have the evening primrose, which of course is not a native plant. They come from the Americas, but we have four species there, large flower, fragrant, common, and the small flower. Fortunately, they don't seem to cause problems by invading places too badly. And they are a great source of nectar for many, many insects. Swollen thighed beetles love them. Uh, bumblebees love um, evening primrose too. Tree mallow is a plant which is very much a southwest speciality and that is also a plant which tends to colonize the bare open areas and if you unless you've got dynamic seed sand dunes allowed to move around plants like tree mallow can disappear. And that is also much visited by many species of bumblebee including the buff tail. Vipers bugloss also flourishes on this sand dune system that's one being visited by a common carder bee. And this is another uh, coastal speciality, Santoflax, only found at Barrow Dunes and Broughton Burrows. It's not native, it's, it's native in the south of Europe, down in the south of France, for example. But at some time in the past, someone's brought it here and it, it's a tiny plant, causes no trouble, and it's actually a rather nice thing to find. It's only about two or three centimetres tall very often. Now, there are lots of course, rare plants, unusual plants on sand dunes, but there are also, of course, many very common plants, many species of dandelion and, and daisy. This is one of my favourites, which I think this is the gobsmackingly beautiful mouse-eared hawkweed, which is dead common. But look at those wonderful leaves, which are supposed to remember a little furry mouse, mouse's ear, and it's gorgeous when it's opens up, up, up too. So that's a dead common plant all over the sand dunes, but again, well worth looking at. Also very common is musk stalks bill, which is the food plant for the brown arbors butterfly. And bugloss, another uh, bare ground specialist, produces lots of, lots of, lots of nectar. Wild clary occurs there, salvia verbenaceae. Um, it likes open either limestone or sandy ground. And hound's tongue too, common hound's tongue, pretty spectacular plant in a, in a low key way and much loved by insects. Now there are other, other plants slightly less easy to identify like this common broom rape. Many broom rapes look very, very similar. Common broom rape occurs abundantly across uh, the Barrow uh, sand dunes, SSSI. There it is coming out of the ground. It's parasitic on clovers and, and composites and it can often be yellow or it could be purple and they're not the easiest of plants to tell a plant. They do demand a pretty close look to sort them out. But whatever species it is, they're easy to find and to identify. This is a, the same species looking absolutely glorious. So many plants that we get on sand dunes, like at, at Barrow, also occur on, on, on chalk grasslands, on the limestones, on the Mendips, on the Chilterns, and up, and up in Yorkshire on the limestones there. And it's a bit of a conundrum where these plants first started off. Were they, did they, did they evolve and develop on downlands? Well, it's quite likely many of these plants did actually develop on dune lands and then move on to downlands when we created them by our tree felling and our livestock grazing. So that's common century. There's um, some pyramid orchids with ladies bed straw, again occur on both downs and duneland. Pyramid orchids are still in flower this year. They're usually way over by now, but it was such a cold start to the year that um, I've seen, well, I've seen hundreds in flower in the last couple of days. Uh, and they're still out there if you want to hunt for them. And bee orchids too uh, are still in flower. We usually think of them in flower of the last week of May and the first week of June. But in some sites, 
they are still just coming out. And you'll find loads of these, dozens if not hundreds, on Barrow Dunes. Some are darker and some are bigger and some are smaller, but they are a fabulous looking plant. Here's a general view of some uh, pyramidal orchids and also in the back left hand side, some, uh, some marsh spotted orchids mixed in too. So this is just a, a bit of an aerial view of, of Barrow Dunes Nature Reserve. You've got the beach on your left. Uh, on the right is actually the uh, Barrow Dunes, uh, Burnham and Barrow Golf Course. You can uh, probably work out where, the, where that is. And then in, in this section in here, we've got, uh, we've got a real uh, saline lagoon, which used to be much bigger. It's continuously drying out. But in that area there, you get some pretty fabulous southern marsh orchids, which grow really quite huge. They're still in flower at this very moment in time too, and very dramatic that they are. Also on some of the um, slightly drier, but still damp ground, we have marsh hellebrine orchids, which look like that. They're growing much silverweed. This is very much a pioneer species too on, on when, when you get new sand dune areas develop and they get slightly vegetated up with grasses, but they're still damp. Uh, it's that's when the um, marsh hellebrine seeds, which are dust like may blow into it. They're pollinated by a very small lassia glossum or furrow bees. So there's part of the, uh, the edge of the golf course uh, at Barrow and there's a footpath which crosses it um, and if you want, the, the best place is to go from the, the Barrow Co-op car park. Uh, walk across the footpath from the Barrow Co-op car park. And that's where I'm standing on that. And then you may well come across, because they go right next to the path, these rather formidable and amazing lizard orchids. This is the biggest and the best group of lizard orchids that Somerset has. There may be a couple of hundred there uh, in the last two or three years. It was long thought that these were pollinated by um, flesh flies, you know, carrion flies, because they do have a rather strange smell. But it's been shown that that isn't really the case. Uh, and they're actually pollinated by small, small bees. Quite an astonishing looking orchid, really. Um, they didn't do very well this year because it was so cold. Uh, last year they were, they were almost a metre tall, some, sorry, half a metre tall this year they're a lot smaller. So I've, I've now carried on on that footpath, uh, pass, pa passing by the lizard orchids, and then this is where I'll come out for my view of, of the sand dunes. And if you go there in the very early morning, you may see some wildlife that doesn't show up at all in the latter part of the day, but you get a lot of foxes there, and you also get a lot of uh, roe deer there, which I think spend a lot of the daytime just lurking in the heavy heavy shrub, which is mainly hawthorn and, and also sea, sea buckthorn. There are also badger sets that, there too. <clears throat> Just to run through some of the butterflies at Barrow, this is a, a migrant, but you get a lot of clouded yellows there. It's a favorite place. Wall brown, this is very much a stronghold for the wall brown butterfly. Caterpillars feed on grasses. And um, there's the underside of the wall brown. Uh, you get a lot of small heaths. A small skipper, large skipper, small copper, common blue, very common there. There's the female with the, the, the sort of dark patches on the top, top of the wing. And we also have there a brown argus, which is not one of our commonest butterflies and is very often associated with them. Um, downland and feeding on the caterpillars feeding on rock grows but at Barrow Dunes where there is a very big population they feed on on stalk bit, stalks bills um, and they've done very well there in the last two or three years it's been very good to see them there this is a, a large moss sorry a large or moss carder bumblebee and the dunes are pretty good for for bees of many sorts this is the um, uh, ground dwelling in in, in uh, make burrows in the sand Ivy bees, they feed on ivy, but then they tunnel into these sand banks at Barrow Dunes. There's a few buzzing around. Fabulous um, abdomen there, isn't it? Stri stripy. And we also get the silvery leaf cutter bee, which cuts small portions of leaves off of a variety of plants and then makes it into a little cylinder uh, it's in, in an underground tunnel, lays its egg in there, and then puts um, pollen 
nectar derivatives into there for the caterpillar to feed on. So that's a silvery leaf caterpillar and there's a female dragging her little bit of leaf in to line her tunnel. The males have glorious um, green eyes. There are many bees there uh, and in fact um, we, we, we have no idea how many. It, again it's been rather neglected by uh, entomologists I'm not being rude to entomologists. I know lots of other places they've gone to on a grand job, particularly the Somerset levels has had a huge amount of input from entomologists and ornithologists in general looking at what there is. But the poor old coast, because of that muddy reputation, has been neglected to quite a large degree. This is one of the blood bees, so named for the red abdomen. We don't actually know what one this is yet for sure. Um, we're still working on what that one is, but there are 16 species that look very similar. There are also a great number of nomad bees too. Now these are bees that don't have a nest. They, they do parasitize uh, bumblebee nests, other bee nests. Um, and so that's why they're called nomad bees because they don't have their own home. Um, but they are, well, I think they're fabulous. So this is Gooden's nomad bee. Uh, there's a Flavus nomad bee. I don't know what you think, but I think they're absolutely stunning. And uh, look at that one, Lathbury's nomad bee. And that lays its eggs in, in various Andrina bees. I think that's a really quite a gobsmackingly gorgeous bee. But we, we just don't seem to take any notice of them there. And Barrow is full of them. This one's a nice one. This is the ashy mining bee, which burrows into, into ground, called ashy because of the, the gray, well, it's got a gray, uh, gray thorax and also a gray moustache. And they burrow underground, but also collect nectar from all sorts of common plants like, uh, like that hawk, hawk weed. That's the, the ashy mining bee. Lots of wasps there, the, just the German wasp, and also the bee wolf. Um, this is uh, a wasp which specializes in catching honeybees, which it then takes underground and uses as food for its caterpillars. And that one's at, um, that one was one at Minehead. So there, it's called a, a honeybee. And then it drags it down the hole, lays an egg on it. It's, this, the bee is paralysed, by the way. It's not cured, it's paralysed it. So it stays alive as long as possible underground and doesn't go rotten before the caterpillar can eat it, before the, its caterpillar can eat it. There's a, a bee wolf again. So all along our coast, not just at Barrow, you can find insects which burrow into the sand dunes or into a compacted ground at the back of the beach. And this is the sand tail digger wasp. Uh, they often just pop out and look around to see what's going on. Still working on the idea of that one. Some of these digger wasps uh, take bees. This one, Lestiferous binctus, uh, feeds on frog hoppers. And you can see it's carrying a frog, hump, frog hopper just beneath it, itself, just there. Um, so there's a, there's a whole world of bees and wasps out there, which we really know very, very little about. And it, it would make a most wonderful research project for a person or for a group of people to just to find out just what sort of um, uh, ants, bees and wasps we've got for sure along our coast. So beetles too. There's a whole range of, of, sort of coasty beetles, which we might find. This is a stinking iris, uh, which has a weevil, which is a beetle. This is the um, nationally scare iris weevil which we've only fairly recently found out to be found along the coast on um, on on plants uh, on, on ivy this is a i think it's a rather fine looking weevil uh, there's also some real real coast specialists this is the snail beetle ablateria levigata it's very local in britain really only occurs on sandy shores <clears throat> and this one does voraciously kill or eat and kill um, snails. There's an adult feeding on a, on a brown lip snail <clears throat> and they also have larva that are incredibly um, ferocious. They run around, many beetle larva live quite quiet lives hidden away in places in, in rotten tree stumps or underground but this one runs around the beach looking quite quite terrifyingly dangerous and they and they bite into the soft parts of, of um, all sorts of tiny mollusks and, and even the common garden snails too sometimes. So this is um, our rarest beetle that we might find on Somerset's coast, it's the tiger, tiger beetle, which only occurs uh, 
in the southwest in two places. It occurs at Broughton Burrows in Devon, and it's been recorded at Barrow Dunes in Somerset. It hasn't been seen since 2016. We don't know that it's there, and we would love to think it was. One of the reasons why it may not be there is because its habitat is right on the front of the four dunes. It lives underneath timber, like you can see there, which gets washed up onto the beach. But in the last four or five years in particular, we have seen people doing two things. And again, you know, they weren't doing it to, to destroy these beetles, but people take driftwood home to have in their garden as an aesthetically pleasing bit of driftwood, and that's a fine thing. But also it's been a huge rise in people using this, this wood uh, for a beach barbecue. So if we went back 15 years, or even 20 years, there was way more dead wood and branches and logs lying on the beach for these beetles to live under. And that is their, that is their chosen habitat on the front of the dune, hiding underneath uh, timber and their larva live in the same places too. Um, and then they make forays out onto the open sand dune at the front to catch flies, smaller beetles, all sorts of um, small uh, invertebrate. But they're having a very, very, very tough time. And I think this probably should become Somerset's sort of target animal for a real species project, because it would be really sad to lose this really fine. I'll just go back. There. It's a rather fine looking creature there. I think it is. It's quite big, too. It's, it's um, about a centimetre and a bit, a bit long. If Sands want to support a conservation project on a, for an animal, I reckon a June tiger beetle could, could do with some, some big help. So that's the sort of stuff it likes. There are other ones that are still there um, in the same sort of habitat, but they're not so dependent upon dead wood. This is the strand line burra, Broscus cephalotus, which also feeds on all sorts of um, invertebrate on the beach. And its larvae tend to live um, quite deep in the sand and look just like that. Lots of other beetles found all on the coast, like the sulfur beetle, rather a gorgeous looking creature. You get garden chafers, which you get in your garden too. But a real coast speciality is the June chafer, very local in Britain. Um, and I found that at Barrow several times, but we haven't found it anywhere else except at Barrow uh, up, up to date. And this is another nationally scarce beetle. It's uh, one of the reed beetles, Plutomarus, uh, another really uh, fabulous looking critter. There's three of them thinking about mating. And we get black-headed cardinal beetles. And we found this beetle at Barrow. This is a click beetle. This is a, um, a nationally scarce ancient woodland creature, uh, but it likes uh, silver birch. And there's quite a lot of old silver birch around on the dunes at, at Barrow in particular. And I found this on the path um, last year. But again, we know nothing about their distribution in Somerset really at all. Uh, slightly more common things are uh, that you'll find all along the coast from uh, Glenthorne in the west to uh, uh, right along to bring down is the 22 spot ladybird. Uh, and here are six that you can find regularly along the coast. Lots of flies too. Here's a June robber fly. These really are the, um, these are like the, the peregrines of the fly world. They're quite big. I mean, uh, almost up to two centimetres long in the bigger ones. They're voracious predators that race around the beach, grabbing anything that they can get their teeth into. Uh, the kite tail robber fly specialise in feeding on, on hoverflies. And the June robber fly often takes stuff as big as a common blue damselfly, which is ridiculously big, really, but they, they do do it. They are incredibly exotic creatures once you get to know them. This is a real coast specialist, the, the, the really gorgeous coastal silver stiletto fly. Beautiful and silvery. You might not like clegs. I mean, even I don't like clegs that much uh, sometimes. But along the coast, particularly where they're in salt marshes, you'll find this one, the big spotted cleg. It's a nationally scarce salt marsh species which we found at Porlock Marsh. Look at those eyes, isn't it? Uh, fabulous. Loads of spiders too. There have been, uh, there are two or three people, Francis Farr Cox, for example, who has looked at spiders along the coast. And Francis has been incredibly helpful to me in trying to work out what we've got. This is a dead common one, obviously, the uh, gets in your garden, the crab spider, catches all sorts of flies. 
Uh, but this one really is very much an open ground, sandy ground species, the running crab spider. There's a male, there's a female. You can see the habitat that they, they run around on. This is a common one, but they like um, the back of beach, particularly the zebra spider. You've probably got this in your garden, but you get a lot of them in, in, in salt marshes too. This is a real coast specialist, the June wolf spider, Arctos of Perita, fabulous camouflage. So there's a sort of typical sand dune view that uh, you'll get at, at Barrow, but the sand dunes are good at Minehead and at Dunster Beach, at Dunster Beach too. And all the sandy places along the whole of our coast, you get these spider hunting wasps. So there's a dead, a dead spider that's actually been bitten and paralyzed by one of these spider hunting wasps. And then if you sit still and stand still long enough where well, you find one of these spiders lying there, or you might see this, the wasp dragging it along. Um, this is the leaden spider wasp. So they, they bite these spiders and paralyze them. And then they drag them down the hole. There it goes. And then they lay their egg on it and the egg hatches out into a larva, which then feeds on the, the paralyzed spider. So I'm coming to the end, end, end of my tour, really. So I've gone from Barrow Dunes now right along to, to the western end, Porlock Bay, which is really is the most amazing feature. I, I'm very privileged in the work that I've done along the coast to meet entomologists, ornithologists, archaeologists from all around the world who got in touch with me and all the Somerset Wildlife Trust to talk about elements of Somerset Coast. And I recently took some German and Dutch ecologists to the coast here. And we stood up on Hurlstone Point and looked west. And they said they had no idea that we had, they'd always thought of Somerset as a pretty boring, they, they heard about Devon, they'd heard about Cornwall, but they'd never thought about coming to Somerset until they contacted us. And we took them up to Hurlstone Point and looked west across towards Exmoor. And they said it was one of the most beautiful landscapes they'd ever seen wherever they'd been in the world. This was to them a world-class, gorgeous landscape. And it is, it's on our doorstep and we perhaps do take it for granted. It's an astonishing place. It's so different to the sort of the Somerset levels part of Somerset, you know, the sort of meadows and cider and grazing livestock. When you come here, you really are in the most amazing, rugged and wild landscape. I've been taking people to Hillstone Point over the last 10 years to look for marine mammals. And we really had a huge amount of new information. We now know that porpoises breed uh, in Pollock Bay. We don't know the true numbers, but they're, they're there every month of the year, every week of the year. And we do see a, quite a lot of um, youngsters. Uh, we see mums with newly born uh, porpoises. And again, we, we, we don't factor this into our conservation plans for Somerset and we should, we should be doing that. So these are photographed just from where you saw those people standing above the, um, above the cliffs, leaning on the railings. And these are harbour porpoises, about half the size of, you know, of dolphins. We also get quite a lot of um, Atlantic seal sightings there, there too. So, <clears throat> um, I did my coast book back in 2011. We've sold 2000 copies of that. Um, and the Somerset Trust are now in a new stage of, sort of starting out a new phase of coast conservation. And I'm producing this new book, The Nature of Somerset's Coast, which has been a great excuse for me to explore and to find things and to talk to people. But I hope this new book will also open up a new sort of wave of coast uh, conservation and enthusiasm. And as part of uh, finding about Somerset's coast, I decided I, I had to go down onto Selworthy Sands and Bossington Beach, which you can really only do in two ways. You can let yourself down this rope, which is almost semi-permanently anchored on that rock, or you can go through the sea cave from below Hurlstone Point. And um, only, I think it was probably about two and a half, uh, three weeks ago, I persuaded my son to accompany me down that rope, we, we abseiled down onto the beach where I'd never been before. It's pretty rugged. 
um, huge boulders at the bottom. And then we turned west past this fabulous um, bit of rock formation. This is some Devonian uh, rocks that have been shifted and pushed into weird sorts of shapes and up to the entrance to the sea cave. You can see just that's me bending over looks like that. You can see the light coming through from the other side. And then we went through the sea cave to the other side and there we are looking out onto, um, onto Porlock Bay. I'd heard about this cave since I started back in 2011, but it was always either too difficult or the weather was bad or no one else wanted to do it or I felt I chickened out from doing it. So I la I've done it. I feel quite triumphant. That was the last bit of Somerset's coast, which I ideally wanted to visit. We didn't find anything spectacular in the cave, but of course the setting was spectacular in its own right. So um, the new book hasn't finally been put together, but we have got a cover. My editor and designer has put together a cover and we're going to do a pre-publication offer for the book um, during November, December, um, and it'll be done in partnership with the Somerset Wildlife Trust. And you'll be able to sign up to buy the book at a specially reduced price. And then it'll actually come out in, I hope in all its glory, in uh, December and January. And I must say, it, it really has been a huge honour and fun to be involved with another book because it does it does push you to check what you're saying and to check what you think and what's written to try and be absolutely sure that you really are saying, you know, what is true and, and what is out there. And I'm very much looking forward to the book coming out. And that really just about brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. So do I do I do anything? No, you just no, sit there and listen. <laughs> Nigel, that was really, I, I was absolutely fascinated. I had no idea there was such a variety. Now, listen, before we go on to asking questions, I want to know how, how can we get hold of your book that's coming out? How would you, would you do that? You're muted. <laughs> um, uh, you can get hold of it by, well, you can sign up for the pre-publication offer. How? How? How well, 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 uh, well, I can probably tell you in about a week's time. Okay. Um, we can send you a pre-publication flyer e electronically. Okay. Um, so I, I, I can, I will make sure that Pisces Publication or myself will send through to Sands uh, the ability, ability to do that. And thank you for sounding so enthusiastic. Well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, uh, there will, it, we hope that the Somerset Wildlife Trust's AGM will take place in November. Yes. Uh, Overton, and we will be it will be there will be some uh, a couple of uh, chapters will, will have been printed out to show people what it looks like and you'll be able to sign up there but okay. it will we it will you, we will make sure that anyone who would like to sign up can do so okay, well, we've got a book cover I've written all the 80,000 words we've got all the images we've got all the maps but now the design has to sit down and I say wrestle it into shape yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's exciting. So we could put a, a flyer onto the Sands website. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, not a problem at all. Yeah. So let's get back to your talk because that was really very interesting. Um, I've got various questions, especially Hinkley Point. Hinkley, is this going to have an effect on the wildlife? It's a big question. Um, Hinkley Point, I mean, visually, it's horrible. I can see it from the top of my street. Um, the biggest impact that Hinkley Point has is the, the cold water, the cold seawater that is sucked in to cool it and then goes through the turbines to cool it, does destroy millions and millions and millions of fish eggs and small fish. Mm -hmm. And it's been doing that ever since it was built. Um, various organisations, uh, official and non-official, are trying to put pressure on the whole design team at Hinkley Point to try and do a lot to mitigate the huge impact that it does have on marine life. Um, yeah, so that, that the biggest impact is on, on fish eggs and young fish and other young creatures in the Bristol Channel. Do, do they put hot water out again? Because I know they suck in for cooling, don't they? Do they, they suck cold hot... water in and then it goes back out as warm water. Uh, the warm water that's going out does encourage giant limpets, but they're not, you know, and other giant creatures just because of the heat. Yeah. As, as I have looked at all the facts and figures about 
radiation. I'm not an expert, but the, uh, the worst radiation in the Bristol cha Channel is from Sellafield. Right. Not from Hinkley <laughs> Point. Now, that's, that's not a good answer, is it? <laughs> no, well, that's a long way away. <laughs> Gosh, OK. Right, let's try and look, think about some nature things now. So somebody's asking, has, um, have you found any jellyfish in Somerset? Um, oh, yes. This, yes, this person had recently heard that they were proliferating globally. Well, they are, well, jellyfish, I, ha I didn't put any jellyfish in because I thought it was too specialised. Right. I love jellyfish, I love snorkelling with jellyfish, and I have found probably about eight species of jellyfish. They are proliferating globally. That's because we have overfished in the wider sea, many fish eat jellyfish, a particularly small juvenile jellyfish. And if you take away the vast numbers of fish that we have, the jellyfish are taking off. And it has upset the balance of nature in the open ocean to a considerable degree. Mm. The best place to look for jellyfish is probably Porlock Bay. So I would I recommend going there. Around Porlock Bay. So, any particular sorts of jellyfish? Well, the, the, moon, <coughs> the moon jellyfish is the commonest one, but we also get uh, Pelagia noctiluca, uh, which I don't think has got a common name. And we also get the um, common blue jellyfish. And we also get the compass jellyfish and the one that's known as the dustbin lid jellyfish. Gosh, which it's is big, a, big, a massive thing. Doesn't sting you at all. Yeah, so yeah, quite good. Pelagia noctiluca is my favourite because it's it um, you know it, it, it shines at night. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> quite alarming if you saw a lot of them at once, I suppose. Yeah. So I've got a question here. What are the main threats to the Somerset coast, and to what sort of conservation projects are underway to mitigate them? That's a big question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> The biggest threat to Somerset's coast is climate change and rising sea levels. Mm. And the fact that we have a hard landscape behind much of that beach and we haven't got room to allow it to move back. I mean, no, I mean, come on, everyone knows we live on an island and it crumbles all the time and it stuff gets deposited, stuff gets washed away. And if I, I, the sand dunes in particular would like to be moving back quite a lot and we, 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 we that is the problem it's called coastal squeeze you've got the sea coming in higher than what it used to you've got our road there and the coast is going to get squashed it's it's a huge issue um, it is it is a huge issue how would you sort that out are you able to talk to local authorities or we do, yes and local local authorities know that and they have their own long-term strategic plans, which would terrify their residents if they started to talk about them. You know, you know, do we have to move Barrow? Do we have to move Barrow and Burnham back? Sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. But, but yes, I mean, you know, it might sound dramatic, but that is the reality yeah. of what can, what we might need to do. And because yeah. the particularly the eastern end of Somerset is pretty heavily utilised. So that's a huge issue. Um, so that's that's what the sort of global thing, but it's it's not far away. It's only you know, twenty fifty, not very far yes. away. Um, the yeah. other issues are um, wintering, wintering, winter visiting white waders and wildfowl do come onto those very busy beaches at, at Barrow in particular, and the use of the beach in the winter time is getting more and more. And that's good because people are exercising more. But how we how we manage the public access onto those beaches where you do have this sort of internationally important congregations of birds trying to rest, having flown you know, 4000 miles from somewhere up in the north. So that that would be good if we if we could work out some way of giving them some quiet, pl quiet places. Quiet and other counties do do that in Suffolk and Norfolk. They do have sort of winter visiting wading bird wardens yes. who talk to people so that 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 would be something which would be good to do yes yeah, so i think they have a similar problem down on studland beach in in, uh, in dorset yes, yes i know studland very well yeah yeah um, yeah we do have a few pairs of summer breeding waders and that's ring plover and oyster catcher 
they still try and breed on our beaches and sometimes they do and we would like to work out how we could protect them to give them some summer quiet in a, in a few places and I'm again sure, i'm sure it must be solvable it must well, be again, they've done it in norfolk and suffolk the wildlife exactly. like the local authority they now fence off temporary fence places off and the yeah. birds nest but absolutely because somerset's coast has had this sort of low profile you know it's muddy there's not much there we don't have a strong background of working on conservation problems yeah and then and then moving on because i don't want to take up all the all your time but um there are creatures like the june tiger beetle mm. which is a i, I think a, a fabulous looking critter only occurs in a couple of places in the southwest surely we could come up with a plan to try and keep more dead wood there by asking people not to take it away it needs a sort of a it needs a little bit a little bit of an action plan it needs a project, doesn't it? Perhaps this is something that the Sam's uh, Natural History Group yeah, might well, want to yeah. take on, you see. Yeah, well, and obviously, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in my role with Somerset Wildlife Trust, I'm there to liaise and coordinate yeah. and try and help. And there are two or three other species like that which occur along the coast that we don't know very much about. We think they might be there. Um, there's something called the sand runner, which is a, 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 a bug, shield bug, um, that runs around on the sand dunes. We don't, haven't seen it for ages. Is it there? Is it not there? And it would be great to have a list of species for Somerset's coast, whether it's yeah. birds or, or insects, that need some help, need some sort of publicity um, to get. I mean, the Somerset Trust is working on that. But again, they've been preoccupied with the Somerset levels for many, many years. And they now have a, a much stronger team looking at the coast. But it, they don't have to do it on their own. You know, no, we should be able no. to work in partnership and for I'm sure I'm sure we could support. offer something. I'm sure we could offer support. Yeah. There must yeah. So very we're trying to answer about what are the what are the threats to the coast? That was yeah. quite an exhausting answer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask that one. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> okay. So uh, another question, Dunes. Is the sea buckthorn a problem in Somerset or is it an asset? Yeah, uh, sea buckthorn is a native plant in East Anglia. It was first planted on Somerset's coast in the early 1900s, being reintroduced from East Anglia to try and stop the sand blowing onto golf courses. Right. Yeah, it was, and it, it's been used around the UK for that purpose too. It does tend to be over invasive and does shade out many fine native uh, June, June and plants. So the, the volunteers at Barrow do spend a huge amount of time cutting it, clearing it away. It does have advantages. It produces huge amounts of food for wintering thrushes. Good. And it does provide an awful lot of cover for birds that breed in it. But it is always an ever-present threat yeah. sweeping across. Yeah. yeah, pushing other plants out. Pushing other plants out, yeah. OK, somebody would like to know if there is a published list of Somerset seaweeds. And if so, how many species are there? Well, there is a published list in my old book. Right. There you go. Sorted. Um, there's 700 seaweeds around the UK. And we have about 120 in, in Somerset. Um, yeah. So M mostly up on the, up the northwest or, or generally? Um, you can't get away from the fact we are an estuary and it's more fresh water towards the east more salt to the west. So as you go west, the species numbers go up and up and up and up and up and up. Yeah. Um, but you will find seaweeds, I mean, you can find seaweeds right up on, you know, up at Avon Mouth docks, you'll yeah. find bladder rack. Yes. Um, the best place to look for seaweeds is probably in Porlock Bay. Yeah. Where you can find 70 species if you've got enough patience to look. Gosh, and isn't snorkeling fun? I think it's one of the best ways of seeing what is underwater. I know, yes. Yes, I, I am an, an avid snorkeler. And yeah. I, always, I always wish I could snorkel more, but the chances of getting a good tide and still weather and sunshine are amazingly low. And, and I think it's so much better than going diving because you don't have all that stuff you have to carry around. Yes, I am a all, diver All you too. need is a good mask and a, and, a, and a snorkel and you're away, really. Yeah, I am. I am a, I've, dived, I've dived a lot. But yes, it's, mm. snorkeling is so simple. Yeah. And you can Everybody learn so much. It. And of course, yeah. you don't have to snorkel in 10 metres of water. You can yeah. snorkel in 
you know, uh-huh. in, a, yeah. in a meter of water. Exactly. It's, it's yeah. wonderfully safe. And it's like seeing a whole new world underneath the sea. Yeah, it's very um, good. I, I would th- I, 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 I keep hoping that other people will snorkel mm. uh, at Porlock safely and perhaps with a friend. And we will learn so much more if people do put their head under water and yeah, and have, a have a little look and see what's down there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're coming to the end now. Oh, there's oh, one more good. question here. Do we have a breeding turn breeding turn colonies in Somerset Coast, like little terns? No. no. Little terns did once breed on Steart Island back in the 1950s, I th- I believe. But no. Um they do all these turns pass along the coast, but they just don't seem to find it right. It doesn't seem to suit them. That's fair oh, enough. Yeah. Sorry about that. No. Yeah. Okay, I think we've come to the end now. Um, Nigel, that was really very enjoyable and very exciting. I hope you stay in touch with Sans and I hope we can do some more work together. I, I think that will be fun. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. So that was really wonderful and exciting um, talk from Nigel there. Um, we have some more. Um, we don't have any more sounds lectures coming up. But I think we'll be planning a whole series in the autumn. However, the Blankton Local History Society does. And on the 14th of July, which isn't so far away, um, they will be presenting a webinar on the creation of Blankton Lake. And on the 13th of October, um, the Blagden Local History Society will also be giving a webinar on the Winscombe project. If you need any more information about how to register, it's on the SANS website. And don't forget, if you'd like to donate, there is a link to the SANS donate button under chat or also on the SANS website under donations. So that only leaves me to thank Nigel for his excellent talk and, of course, the webinar team, Nathaniel and Tony. And thank you for all coming along. And hopefully we'll see you again at another SANS lecture. Thank you and goodbye.